thanks to to you team thanks to inge uh, for being with us today i just uh, introduced uh, the webinar today as chair of the nap network of academics and professionals from eden european distance and learning network it is really uh, a great uh pleasure for us to restart uh the webinar series that we offer as a part of uh, our uh, engagement as a network of academics and professionals committee within the eden uh, network um, we had to to stop for uh, for a little while uh, after the emergency came up and we 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 started the 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 eden uh series uh in a minute we we are going to show you some some slides uh related to the activity of the nap uh the nap as you can see here is at uh, its members service uh we try uh to support first of all networking uh we provide uh meeting and communication forums uh we work uh in um in, in synchrony uh with a steering committee uh that uh tries to uh provide information for members and opportunities build up a, a personal portfolio this is what I always say NAP is for is a professional development committee. Uh, it promotes communication, networking, as I was saying. We support also uh, in finding partners uh, uh, for new projects, uh, new uh, research ideas. This is the uh, theory committee as it is composed at the moment, but uh, our uh, mandate is going to an end. Uh, there's the possibility also to uh to step to step in and so to participate in the elections that are going to take place in a few uh months from now uh here you have a, a picture of the members area where you can participate take part uh, include your uh profile um being uh, uh, at the member service means that this is a large community and that's what we want to be uh, with all the opportunities we offer um if you are an institutional uh, member you can delegate up to 30 individuals in the nap uh, you can attend conferences at reduced fees of course when it will be possible to have uh, uh, face to face uh, conferences again uh but the most important thing is that we can work together we can create new partnerships we can um discuss together as we are doing during these uh, webinars uh, for developing uh, new ideas new researches new uh, cooperation um of course there are also publications connected to the eden where you can uh, contribute to uh we use social media so we work on on uh, twitter uh, and on all the other social media we um uh, offer different kind of webinars and this is one of the series i was mentioning we will have others until um the end of the term and we try really to listen to uh, our members uh, and colleagues ideas and try to interact the most we can so join the nap uh, join us uh, on our social uh, networks and uh, uh, thank you um uh, get more information about our um, next events on our website uh, follow us and thank you so much to Inge and Timothy for being with us today and have a wonderful webinar today and thank you to all the participants i know there are so many today so it's a very good opportunity for all of us thank you thank you very much antonella 
Um, and once again, welcome to this um, Eden Nat webinar today on student evaluation during and after COVID-19. Uh, I think it's a very challenging uh, topic for you, Inge. We have uh, high expectations, and I think it's <laughs> going to be very interesting because um, I don't think it's necessarily difficult for us to get our students online. Most of them are, are in fact, actually on on there. Trying to engage with them in a, in a meaningful way is difficult. That's a harder problem, but the real killer problem in a way is how to actually evaluate them. And that's the, the question that's been coming up in some of our other webinars. And I think it's on a lot of people's uh, lips. So, I mean, I'm not going to present you because I think uh, most people already know you. Your bio data is on the Eden website. Just to say to people that um, Inge has very kindly divided her presentation into three parts. And um, after each one, We'll, we'll have a, a brief pause so um, so she can uh, have a chance to answer some of your questions. And at the end, we'll have a, a general question and, and answer session. OK, thank you very much, Inge. I'll pass it over to you. OK, thank you. So uh, I'll wait for the slides to come up. But in the meantime, I will start with myself. I think, as you said, Tim, it's a very important topic. And it's also quite a... A challenging one, but I, I truly believe that if we share each other's experiences and if we share each other's uh, insights, that we will find better solutions than before. So starting from that idea, I can share my own experience in terms of exams, and I will make you all jealous. <laughs> During my master and in order to get my master and in order to get my PhD, I only uh, took part uh, in two examinations. That's all. And one of those examinations was an online exam. So it was really rigorous uh, exam. And the other one was like a defense, a normal, regular PhD defense. So I think that from a personal experience, I'm really happy that I didn't have to go to more examinations because I'm really not that good at exams, which is why the topic interests me. Now, on the other side, I have worked at the Institute of Tropical Medicine and as well as in the renewable or sustainable energy sector. This are, these are two sectors that require quite a high standard of health and safety uh, guidelines and standards. So I do have experience with really very tough and very high quality certified uh, guidelines that need to be followed and that need to be assessed. So this is where I am positioned. I'm somewhere in between the belief that formal assessment, formal examinations are really important and useful, but on the other hand, that non-formal uh, assessments in the in or creative formal assessments and exams can benefit us all at the same time. Okay, this is how we get to this. Uh, in a way, I think we must all question ourselves before starting the, the full presentation, what is the purpose of an exam or any type of uh, learning assessment? Because is it really necessary to only look at what we classically do in the, in the classical examination sense? I don't think so. So that's why this webinar is uh, divided into three sections. We will have a look at proctoring tools, uh, see what it is, what it can do. We will have a look at moving from a closed book to an open book exam and what the benefits are. And of course, always looking at the downsides as well. And then have a look at the team or group exams and what they can, uh, where they can help us. So let's start with the proctoring uh, tools. Now, proctoring tools are basically a kind of software that is added to your learning environment and which enables you to assess or evaluate students and learners at a distance. It's, uh, there's, there are a number of proctoring tools out there and it's, all, it's still increasing the amount of solutions that are out there, but basically, they follow the same steps. And 
you can use them for students at a distance, but you can also use them for if you have big classrooms, like huge auditoria, and where you need to provide examination options for huge amounts of students and allowing a different type of examination to take place. Now, I don't know in this, on the side, small side detail, the picture I show you there on the left is a picture of a WeConnect Barco lecture hall, which is already a fully fledged uh, online lecturing hall that we are going to start using uh, at Inno Energy, where I work uh, as well, and which will allow easier online assessments. And But so for the proctoring tools, I think um, we must wonder how far we need proctoring tools. Because in a way, if you think about what, one of the reoccurring ideas or, or remarks that I get when I mention proctoring tools to our own institutions, and we work with a lot of European institutions, both universities as well as uh, companies, one of the reoccurring ideas is, yeah, but what? how can we avoid that students cheat on their exams? That the, that's the main issue. While my first answer to that is, maybe it's not that bad. Of course, I can hear you and saying, yeah, look, we have our degrees, we need to have a certain amount of quality, which is true. But in a sense, if you look at cheating, it is problem solving, it is working with peers, it is being able to curate content really quickly to see what is right and what is wrong. So to me, it features 21st century skills in some way, if you cheat. However, I totally agree that you don't want people to cheat and by cheating, they no longer know what they need to know. Then you have a problem. Cheating while still knowing everything and finding great innovative solutions, then I say, okay, why not? So starting from there, how does a proctoring tool really work? Although there are a lot of proctoring tools out there, the steps they use are basically the same. You have a software solution which can be embedded or, or linked to your uh, LMS or your LXP if, you're, if you have a learning experience platform. And you can add it to it and use the proctoring tool as a digital um, uh, examiner. And so what the proctoring tool basically asks you to do, a student, what it asks a student to do, is to show and identify themselves as being that person, so by showing the identity card, then to take a picture of their face for later recognition, and then shot their, uh, then activate the proctoring tool which will enable the screen of the computer to be uh, fully recorded. So if you have tabs open as a student, if you are using um, some notes on your desktop, uh, cheat notes, something like that, then it will be recorded. And it will also ask you to make like an environmental check, whether there's nobody in the back uh, helping you or in front of you, helping you out with some of the questions in sign language. Why not? Being uh, innovati innovative. And that is basically the first part of a uh, proctoring tool, to really look at whether the students don't have any additional tools uh, working in the background. Now, this also means that each step that a student takes is actually logged into the system and can be reviewed later by proctors. These proctors can be live proctors, so people that are at a distance 
looking at the screens that the students use to see whether everything is working well and whether they don't cheat, but it can also be done by recording the exam as it moves forward and then sending that recording to a proctoring uh, company and have it checked out by uh, proctors once the recording has been sent to them. In that case, the feedback from those proctor comes back in a report 24 to 48 hours later. So from a student point of view, it's kind of, well, you, you, it's kind of safe in terms of cheating. Well, now in the teacher point, from a teacher point of view, of course, you need to invest some time in it. And you need to invest time in for the admin because you need to check uh, what can they use anything? Can't they use anything at all? Do they uh, have oh, can they only access the questions that you have provided for the exam or something more like in between open book, closed book exam, something like that? Because with each proctoring tool, as you can see here, you have the opportunity to add an additional source that a student can use. This can also be like a 3D uh, uh, design or sketch type of tool. It can be a, a different type of tool. It can also be a calculator, a dictionary, uh, when it's a language um, exam. So there are a couple of options open in the proctoring exam to teachers. The, but as I said before, it's an add-on. So as a teacher, you already have to have an exam set or, a, or an, like a question database set in your uh, learning management system or in your uh, learning experience system. Now, the nice thing is you don't need to walk around when, once your students, uh, or you don't need to be like a live proctor yourself once the proctoring tool is taking over. You can also really uh, time the exams really up to the second almost of each student. And because it's linked to your LMS or LXP, it will be automated, the full process of grading, uh, of possibly weighing some of the questions. But of course, in this, uh, you can see how with COVID-19 coming up, these proctoring tools become much more useful because it's a solution for many universities. And with our partners, there's, uh, for instance, TU Delft, uh, which is a university in the Netherlands that already is using proctoring tools for their students and who have rolled out exams up to 2,500 students for the same exam on the same day, which is pretty, well, it's, it's a huge amount of students. Nevertheless, there is a limitation to students being able to start the same exam. Uh, one of the, I compared a couple of proctoring tools and I will show you my uh, a little comparison later on in the presentation. But mostly you can have like 100 to 150 students starting the same exam within the same hour. So there are some drawbacks that you need to take into account when you set up an exam. But the good thing is students can't take uh, print screens, send it, mail it to other students in the meantime, something like that is not it's, uh, possible once you have a proctoring tool installed on the exam computers. So you have a lot of benefits. There's, of course, the obvious higher flexibility in terms of location. You have a higher flexibility in terms of timing because you can really set up uh, the schedule. You can reduce some of the anxiety for some of the students because they can take the exam in their own natural studying environment which to some students makes a difference as well. And in a way, you have a, quite a safe learning or examination environment 
because of the proctoring tools. In another university that we work with, KTH, which is uh, the Royal Institute of Technology in Stockholm in Sweden, there they use a proctoring tool for all of the exams in the university, but the proctors, the live proctors, are the teachers themselves who walk in between, uh, well, who supervise a part of the exams. That's because using proctoring tools, even ad hoc in the university, is safer than if you don't use them at all. So it's, they're pretty cheat proof. Now, it can also, if you think about post COVID, then it becomes of interest to use a proctoring tool for specific uh, student groups, like athletes. If they are on a mission or they prepare somewhere else, they, uh, they are in training, then still they can take a remote exam. Or if you look at disabled students who cannot make it to the exam, then again, with a proctoring tool set on their computer, they can take the exam or the assessment, depending on what it is. And of course, it's the same for learners having a, some kind of long-term illness. So there are quite a bit of benefits. Now, on the downside, English language dominates all the proctoring tools. There is one tool who is now considering use attracting live uh, proctors who can speak uh, the native language, in this case it's Dutch, but it's pretty difficult because the standards of language um, and uh, communication skills needs to be really high for proctors in order to understand what is happening when the student is taking the exam or the learner, because there are also corporations using proctoring tools. <clears throat> and of course, you need, as a teacher, you need to be, become comfortable. You need to trust the proctoring tool as well. And there are some practical limitations as well, like you have sketches, drawings, sometimes you need to draw it up in like an art class immediately, and you need to be able to confer to, with a teacher in order to say, is this well done? Is this mediocre? Something like that. So there's definitely a practical limitation in that area as well. And it needs a lot of preparatory work. Because, of course, IT needs to be involved, the teachers as well. You need to come to some kind of agreement. And you need, need to set up a special help desk for this, for the students, as well as for supporting the teachers. Now, in terms of other stakeholders, it's easy to come up with the fact that it needs to be chosen, which means that the university or the corporation in a whole must dedicate some time in selecting the best system and every couple of years you need to do the same exercise. You need to make sure that it is LTI and API compliant and also of course if you have previous uh, tools set up for this type of purpose like an LMS, an LXP uh, or any other tools, it needs to be compliant from both sides. And you need to set up support. You, you need to consider whether to use uh, your own proct uh, proctors, your own teachers, or whether to uh, rely on the external proctors. And, of course, the, from a legal side, you need to know whether this policy or this solution is, in fact, uh, consistent with your own internal uh, policies. Now, in terms of pricing, I've, there is, I refer to a document someplace. It's not this, this one on the slide, but on the first slide with the title of the, the webinar, you can find the link to a full document where there's a full comparison of different uh, proctoring tools. In my case, I only limited myself to looking at three different proctoring tools based on the proctoring tools that were already in use uh, with our partners. And if you look at the pricing itself, if you look at the first column, it's clear that they all use a different type of description on what type of uh, 
well, how the pricing works, how it's calculated. So it's a really good practice to try and figure out some kind of even benchmark to see how much to be able to compare it. But it is within the same area between for a thousand students taking 60 minute exams for the first one that's like the 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 highest cost will vary between 14,000 and 18,000 let's see so that's about it with the proctoring tools and then afterwards after some questions uh, I will move to the next open book exam thank, are there uh, thank you very much uh, Inge that was a, a wonderful uh, Part of your your presentation, there's been some questions coming up in the in the chat. I think for for time restrictions, I'll just ask you two of them. Okay, there was a nice um a nice question come up from um from Colum about the uh, you know the 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 practical realities of buying essays because even if we uh, we don't necessarily want our students to sit down and write. Um, it says we know that there are lots of companies, well, companies in inverted commas that that offer that. In fact, some of my yes. colleagues have been contacted and offered money for producing model solutions. What do you think we can can do about that? Well, the essay mills are, of course, uh, to me, for me, uh, I would immediately say if you do an oral exam, they will, it will be, soon be clear that a student cannot solve any question you have or solve it in a very uh, low standard type of way so if but of course an asking for essays is a very is an example of a classic um, type of assessment which means there are solutions that you can buy out there but of course if you make your question like a do you know the kobayashi maru uh, type yes. of uh, well for the well everybody who loves star trek knows the kobayashi maru uh, challenge that's a, you ask a question that cannot be solved or you situate uh, make a situation that cannot be one and then you ask students to come up with a solution as close to the best option there is and if you have such type of questions it's much more difficult to buy an essay from one of those essay mills so that's the only uh, well. yep I think that's a, a very good answer. And um, Jakob Katz also asked a, a question, which I think is very relevant at the moment. Um, and that is, what about taking exams from home when students are actually in the middle of this, of this uh, you know, COVID lockdown? We can't necessarily go to the university to take them. No, indeed. So with the proctoring tool, you can just do it at a distance. If you don't have access to, or if the university doesn't have enough time to go through all the administration of buying a new tool and installing it and uh, using it, because a proctoring tool is something you can send out to any computer wherever located in the world, if it, is, if it does have a strong internet connection, then you can fall back on best practices. And best practices is actually what I have used in the past as well, where you only rely on an audio and a video connection to do the exam and you ask them to show the room uh, before and you um, transform your your questions into more of an oral examination type of questions and then you can also um, do it from home and really short time and without the cost of a proctoring tool of course this does demand extra work you need to transform your questions into more like an open book uh, type of question uh, which fits some content but not all of the content but in the document that i referred to at the at, in the first slide there is also uh well in in it's I think it's in that document where the best practices without the proctoring tool for taking or organizing online exams is also uh, described. Wonderful. Thank you, Inge. I'll, I'll let you get on with the next part of your presentation then. We'll come back to questions later. Thank you. Okay. So next part, next section of three sections, section two. 
open book exams. As was mentioned before, not everybody has the means or the to purchase a proctoring tool and to get online exams going with this proctoring tool. Another option to do is to use classic audio video and uh, allow students to have open book exams. This, in, in fact, it also relates back to distance education in, in when it was like on paper based. You would send out your questions and the answers would come back and it would take some time and you um, phrased the questions in that way that it were open questions because then you would get uh, the best type of answers uh, back. And in a way, I, I like uh, open book exams. So the, the, the best known uh, exams are closed book exams, of course, where you have a fixed amount of knowledge and that knowledge will be assessed using uh, multiple choice questions, essay based questions, uh, but the students or the learner is, isn't allowed to go and look at uh, solutions on the web uh, in the library or uh, just simply ask uh, their colleague. What you can do, um, and so in a way that's, that's the one who is best known, but if you go back into time, you can see that the Socratic method is much older and actually relies on question, answer, question, answer, and there's a dialogue. And you can do the dialogue yourself, one-on-one, -on -one, I, I mean, or you can do the dialogue with multiple peers or um, multiple people and then dig into uh, some of the knowledge and the understanding uh, and the ability to connect concepts using the Socratic method. So in a way, these type of more open book exams are much older if you look at uh, time. Now, an open book exam stands right opposite to a closed book exam. And there is, of course, a gray area in between. But with an open book, uh, you can you ask questions, you have the exam prepared, but the student or learner can go out and use any type of uh, resource that is out there or for more, uh, if you have partial open book exams, they can use some uh, resources. So as I said, why there is there are some benefits of moving towards uh, open book exams. I think most of those choices are based either on pedagogical issues or on philosophical issues. It's again like with the proctoring tool. What do you want them to do? Do you want to avoid cheating or do you want them to become ethical problem solvers using resources and, of course, um, using some ready-to-use uh, knowledge. So an open book exam is useful if you want to organize some kind of online evaluation because it is easier to organize and it doesn't take too much money to, to uh, uh, provide an open exam where you ask to apply and analyze certain knowledge. Now, of course, the if you the, where a closed book exam asks uh, straightforward questions with an open book exam it's about the process of the answer that comes back to you you need to see if it's high quality you need to see if all the key concepts that the students learned in their past uh, period of time are actually mentioned in that process that they use it in the right way and that they have an understanding of how it all fits together. So it's much more in-depth in a way. From a teacher's side, that means that you need to uh, acquire the skill set to be able to relax and say, okay, uh, with an open book exam, you don't have like fixed 
uh, rights and wrongs. It's always somewhere in between. There is a gray area. The evaluation is um, somewhat, well, I say somewhat because of philosophical reasons, somewhat more subjective because you, uh, you can say, look, the intention was right, but this concept was uh, not completely uh, used in the correct way. So as a teacher, you need to build a different type of rubric in order to evaluate the assessment. And if you look at open exams from a teacher point of view, you can say, look, the student can use a limited amount of resources. The student can use uh, within the time frame all resources or you can even step away from the time boundary and say, look, you have 24 hours to come up with uh, the solution to this question, which is like, a, what's it called, the take-home exam, you get, which is really like very well known in distance education. So you have a couple of benefits. The benefits, uh, I see that I have a typo here. Uh, you combine different concepts towards a solution and you request the students to uh, relate that in the answer. You can show the bigger picture of a specific uh, knowledge area. And uh, a good one that I haven't mentioned is the qualitative and quantitative data interpretation that you can also ask. So then you, you provide the student with a set of data you, they have studied the key concepts and you ask them to work with that data to come up with a new solution. So, which is a nice addition to open uh, book exams, I think. And of course, it evaluates a broader uh, array of student knowledge as well. Basically, from my perspective, it fits 21st century skills that uh, people or students need to have. On the downside, in terms of grading, it takes a lot more time from, from a teacher. It, it can be. If it's purely like an oral exam, it goes quickly. But if, it's, uh, if the answers need to be read and interpreted, it will take you a lot more time. And of course, it also lacks in-depth uh, fact response. Like uh, you, for if you look at the health examinations, you need to have, or for surgeons, you need to have immediate knowledge, prepared knowledge, and not just relating concepts together. So it doesn't fit all types of uh, content. And it's, of course, less straightforward in terms of grading. But having set up some, some open book exams myself and looking at the brilliant open book exams some of my colleagues have uh, come up with, I can tell you that it's much more difficult for students to really answer these uh, exams and to answer them correctly in high quality in a specific limited amount of time. There's also this myth about you don't need prior knowledge, which is totally untrue. You need to have the basic knowledge. You need to start from that and build uh, your concepts and understanding from there. So. And of course, people sometimes say, yeah, but if you open up all resources, they can just go there. And it's like the essay mill. They just copy a bit of uh, content and put it in the answer. But a good open book exam uh, question is much broader than just give me a paragraph on this or this subject area. So you will... It, will not do to just simply go out to a resource and copy an answer from there. As an example, I uh, refer to one of our data, well, energy data cases. We are now having two data sets um, for specific uh, student, well, learner groups. We have data sets for academics, specifically those who can code and those who can't code. And the data sets for those who can't code are data visualizations where the people or the students get a data set and need to use that data set and combine and distill and look at uh, causality, also to correlations, 
to indicate how this data set could help them interpret a specific question or challenge in the energy sector, in this case, the energy sector. And so we have a, a similar energy data case for people working in uh, corporations, this, so business people, again, divided into those people who know coding and those people who need to be able to use data uh, visualization. And those data sets are really, they are in high demand and they really work well as an examination uh, tool as well. So, yay, time for Thank you very questions. much, um, Ingi. That was a, a very interesting uh, part of your, your talk. And we had some interesting comments in the, in the chat as well. And uh, we don't have a lot, a lot of time for questions, but uh, I particularly like the comment by Dragwa Salman that, um, who says that uh, they actually like uh, doing open exams and uh, some of them can be done at home and, and smart student projects, etc. But I think uh, Carol Gilles, um makes a very interesting comment and question here that it really depends in a way on how you're actually going to formulate your learning objectives. You know, if you're using Bloom's device taxonomy, etc. And certain mm -hmm. things do need to actually be assessed in a written way. Special things do need to actually be assessed assessed in a written way, especially if you're actually trying to, I guess, train our, the students in the sorts of skills they're going to need when they hit the real world. So I don't know what you think about that. Yeah, definitely. Well, in terms, I totally agree that open book exams are only, well, the, the best type of exams in, in, in my view are a combination of closed book and open book exams. Because you need to have some the basic knowledge even if you have like high level uh, knowledge there's still this central bit of knowledge that you need to have immediate that you need to recall immediately if necessary and use inside bigger picture inside of uh, concepts so in terms of that i totally agree sometimes you need to go for the one or the other but of course in COVID times, at least if you can transform some of the closed book exams into open exams, it will uh, alleviate some of the tension of having to be able to roll out all the exams online. In terms of set, coming up with intended learning outcomes or learning outcomes uh, in general, then um, I, I, for I agree that using Bloom's taxonomy won't be that easy to, uh, well, of course, you can, the higher levels, then it, it becomes easier, again, to uh, build learning outcomes from that, from that. But I do feel that if you have uh, an open exam, even if it's really open, it always comes back to understanding the concepts that they have uh, seen or understanding concepts that they needed to find and analyze and internalize themselves. So it can even be a learning outcome that is part of uh, some self-directed learning initiative that, they, that you ask from them to take up prior to the examination and to transform that into a learning objective. So although it's it's you will most probably but not for all but in most cases you will move up in the bloom's taxonomy you can even with open book exams you can uh, describe the learning objectives and make them really strong and use a rubric to assess the answers that you get against those learning objectives. Yes, thank you. Thank you very much. Um, I think an interesting uh, comment I heard um, the other day as well is that sometimes you can use uh, closed exams or um, with your with with students, for example, even if they're at home. And then because you've been working with them over a period of time and you've established a relationship, then you know roughly how they think and how they're going to reply. So if you suddenly find an answer that doesn't really fit in with your idea of that person, then you can even contact them for an oral follow-up. But I mean, that has to be done in a scaled way. You can't obviously do it with all the all the students. OK, that was wonderful. Let's uh, let's roll on with the, the third part. Thank you. Third part. Uh, where am I here? OK, so now we're going to have a look at group exams. I think the one posing the questions earlier, will hopefully, uh, 
and more of you, of course, will hopefully like it. Um, these group or team exams, why I added this is because I work in a renewable energy organization, which means we work with master's students, PhD students, professional learners, all coming from uh, an engineering or mostly engineering background. Now, in engineering, as you know, you have more, well, you have the same pedagogical formats that are used, but some of them are used more frequently than others. For example, you have design thinking uh, approaches used to come up with prototypes, to come up with um, solutions to challenge based learning and all of that. Now, this is where I come from with thinking that this might be a good addition to um, the group, the online exam uh, options, because we needed them as well. Now, if you think about group exams, uh, so you can think about projects, but the group exam in action for me is can easily be visualized by thinking about hackathons. In a hackathon, you have a couple of challenges. These challenges are normally not yet answered, so it's, it's a real open challenge. And you ask the, those who want to take part in the hackathon to choose one of these challenges. And they can choose it, and then they form a team because they know this is a good hacker, this, is, this person is good in marketing, here's the one we need for um, communication and, and structuring things or managing. And so you build teams, and these teams, within 24 hours, or whichever timing a hack the, that particular hackathon has, needs to come up with a solution within that period of time. And they, can, they have access to a lot of options, and they can uh, consider different choices and build from there. So in a way, I feel that a good group exam has these elements in them. It's a team effort, but at the same time, you rely on the expertise of each individual being part of the team. And everyone's input lifts an, a normal uh, challenge to a higher level and making the end product or the solution, or in this in case of exams, the yeah, the answer uh, makes it better. Now, I added Digi Edo Hack because this is uh, one of the hackathons I'm involved in as a supporter. And this uh, specific hackathon looks for uh, teams who are willing to come up with solutions for education. So, this is really useful in these times. Now, a team exam. Normally, you would plan a team or a group exam if you already have uh, the prior learning in some way uh, team-related. Like if people work on a project, uh, people work on a specific challenge, then that's the moment to consider online group exams. Now, the group... so. Let's see, here we go. Ah. So, in the group exam, it's uh, many of you will have had some experience with uh, evaluating teams. It's the same here. So, you have external and internal experts uh, who will look at the specific content that needs to be evaluated. You have a team presentation provided by the designated team speaker, or you can have the team presentation consisting of smaller bits of the presentation, each time taken online, so one after the other, taking part of uh, the slides, and explaining that part of a project or that part of a solution uh, which is evaluated. Then you get feedback uh, from the examiners, to the full team as well as to the individual team members in order to see if you understood everything correctly, if if there's if everything is transparent to the examiners. 
And after that part of the group exam, you have like a option to add question and answers on an individual level. Why is it important to add these questions and answers on an individual level in an online uh, group exam as well? That's because if you, uh, there's always, as I said, with the closed and open book exams, there's always this basic, under, this basic knowledge that needs to be there. The theories, the concepts, the descriptions or the, the processes that they need to know, the formulas that they need to know. And you need to be sure that each member of that team understands the basic knowledge needed or required for that evaluation. So that's why you would put in questions and answers as well. Of course, it's also important to have an open discussion. As again, I referred to the Socratic method to really dig in deeper and to see the extent of knowledge and comprehension that each of the individual of that team has. And then once it comes to uh, grading, you again, you use, uh, you can either use a rubric that you set up in advance, or you can use uh, like a voting system, talking to one another and uh, seeing how much you would, or which grade you would give to which member of the, of the group. So that's generally the overview of a group exam which you can do online if, of course, you have access and if each of the team members uh, has access to a good audio-video connection, because that's, that's the basic need uh, or tool that you need. Now, in terms of benefits, it's clear that it benefits the multidisciplinary uh, team evaluations. And it's also good for some real-life uh, project evaluation, which we do, and I will show you in a minute. It also fits innovation, but that's, uh, of course, because you, in innovation, you never have straightforward answers. There's always the process of coming closer to a solution. And this is uh, teamwork is really, well, something that works well in, this, in these conditions. And you have a near immediate grading, which saves time, especially if you compare it to open uh, exams that you need to read through. Now, the downside is it takes multiple people, multiple examiners, so it takes much more time, uh, people, uh, time, well, time from the teachers. And the, grazing, the grading is, of course, an interpretation. Again, like with the open book exams, it's less straightforward. Yet, if you have a good instrument, uh, then you can deliver the same rigor of uh, grading. And the, normally, if we look at, if we uh, grade teams, we also consider how they came across, because of course, everybody, because we are a European organization, we take into consideration 21st century skills, and it makes a difference in how they deliver each part of uh, the presentation. And although it's an online team exam, still you can see that certain persons are more open to delivering what they know and others would be more hesitant to know it. So you need to take into account different personalities as well. In terms of preparation, uh, from a teacher's side, of course, you need to prepare the project questions that you will ask, the rubric, in, in an ideal world, you will set up a rubric as an instrument for grading. You need to have the team members all gathered at the same time, including the supervisors. And from an ICT or an IT side, you need to have a durable, consistent and online meeting tool like Adobe Connect here. We can also use Zoom, which is uh, rolled out quite massively during these COVID times. And of course, a recording, because you know that it's all each exam can be questioned by the students or learners taking the exam. So it's better to have a recording for uh, possible litigations or something. And from a student side, you have to have a clear understanding of what is expected 
of you, of course, you need to understand the concepts, you need to be really well prepared as a student, and you need to have social skills, because it is a team effort. This means that everybody has a responsibility towards the whole team as well. But this is, I think, the last slide of this section. Um, well, last but one. The example I want to share very briefly, looking at the time, is the Inno Energy Smart Cities Innovation Journey example. So this is normally something that would be done in real life. It's teams entering into a contest to find the best solution for smart cities. And each time you have these uh, very specific topic. In this case, it was um, Andorra Smart Country Edition. So finding solutions for Andorra, looking at what they have, what the best solutions would be from an engineering energy perspective. And normally it's something that, um, so it's a physical event. And all of a sudden, in just a couple of, I think it was 12 days time or something, they needed to transform it completely into an online event. Now, Mar Martinez and Xavier Crusat, two of my colleagues, which are like brilliant teachers, managed to transform it completely into an online event. And with all of the planned sections taking place and all of the students completely interacting and collaborating with each other to come up with real products in such uh, a brief period of time. So here we tested out uh, group exams which were immediately um, put on the spot and it came out uh, as a real strong contender for uh, student evaluation, so I'm, which made us all even more in favor. So again, uh, before uh, closing or opening up the last questions, I think we must really question the idea of exams before we make any kind of uh, selection in our exams or assessment methodologies and wonder what is the purpose of an exam. And also think what are the other options besides the classic closed book examination option or the using uh, proctoring tools in a limited version, so not opening up uh, resources and only thinking about trying to uh, limit the amount of cheating that is being done. I think it's much more important to think, look, if we consider different types of student evaluations that we look at and does it enhance self-directed learning? Does it enable self-evaluation on where they stand, what they need to do to uh, increase their knowledge? And in the end, I think it would be brilliant for me to give rise to ethical problem solvers using all the tools available. So. That is it. I think this is the last uh, set of questions, so I'm ready. That was a, a wonderful part of the presentation, Inge. And there, we've been having a, a frantic conversation in the in the in the chat. And um, I know that technically speaking, we should be finishing now. But but what the heck? We're going to take a we're going to take a few minutes to to be able to enjoy this opportunity of of uh, asking you some of the questions that have that have come up in 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 that uh, in that chat. I think you've presented a, um, quite an optimistic view of uh, of all the possibilities that that might actually take place. But I think the you know the I think it was a a question asked by um by one of our by one of our members of the. Uh, of the of the public, I can't quite find the exact um, question here at the moment, but I can remember it. And that was that: Do you think that we will make the most of this opportunity that the unfortunate circumstances has given us with the 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 lockdown of the of the the COVID nineteen virus? Do you think we'll come out fighting and stronger, and will have improved and learned from this experience to make learning and and evaluation better? Uh, now you're asking. Well. I can only answer from I'm look I'm a little bit getting a little bit older 
and I have the feeling that although you have you can have a slight tweak of a movement uh, so let's say I would say there will be a slight tweak because people think ah, zoom is nice and I can record some of the slides and use a flipped classroom uh, more fre frequently let's say something like that or Oh well, yeah, maybe you know, let's try open book exam for this bit of my uh, syllabus. But in the, in the end, uh, a person is prone to be well to s stay close to their own personality. My personality is normally positive, <laughs> normally optimistic, or it's terribly pessimistic, and I think. Even though we have with COVID, we could test a couple of tools. Some of those tools will stick post COVID as well. But I don't think there will be like a, a massive shift towards distance education because our institutions aren't yet built for it. And we don't really have this, the administrative structure to most of our institutions. Some of them do to do it. So I think although there is uh, there's I I hope there will at least be a, a small shift but not that it will be massively taken up now with brilliant solutions. Yeah. I think that's a very sensible, very practical and pragmatic uh, um, answer, Ingi, and knowing you is quite appropriate. Um, that, the question I meant that I asked before was from Philip Verren. I found it now in my in my list of questions. Um, okay, from um, Another perspective, I'd like to know what you think about um, structuring assessment with the overall course structure, because if you can imagine that you've got a, um, a series of training, which is like one course after another, after another, and you've got like an onion structure of, of learning building. So therefore, in a way, the, the students, if they, are, if they are cheating, if they aren't really uh, learning and, and being assessed appropriately at the lower levels, then as they get further further out of the onion, if you like, further up the, the, the hierarchy of learning, then they're not going to be able to apply Apply what they what they've learned, aren't they? And surely they're going to have problems anyway. So in a way, it's a self fulfilling prophecy. This question of, of failure and self improvement. Yeah, I think so too. And but the difficulty here with the the problem is if we if each of us would have known COVID was coming, we would have built our courses in a different way already at, at the beginning. Now we are suddenly faced with having delivered content in a certain way, taking into account the assessments that we would normally uh, use in the end, and all of a sudden everything is twisted. So now we are like peddling with a, in a very unstable canoe. We have all of this knowledge that we have, but indeed, in, in the end, even if we if we decide to use more online evaluations or not, once the COVID is passed, indeed, it's this onion layer type of approach that will sift the students that aren't really that knowledgeable or, or that just don't comprehend the basics that will, well, fall out of the the rest of the full four years of master or, or any type of uh, learning journey that they have in front of them. But so I do feel, but I think in, in, in a way an open exam can uh, make it easier to filter them out. But of course, do you need to filter, or do you take students along as uh, for as long as you can, because they will learn something, and it's good for everybody to learn? Or do you say, look, if you can't take it, this is your cut of time and move. There's a philosophical yeah, indeed, part. Indeed, there is. I think this fits in quite nicely with a comment that our colleague Eva made in the in the chat. That in a way that when you're thinking about assessment and its purpose it fits into if you like a more macro level it's a question of institutional and authority uh, uh requisites and, and and priorities so i think it's very interesting what you're what you're saying i'd like to ask you a question that came up um also from a colleague of ours alistair grillman who said he actually liked what you were saying about group assessment process and uh, he specifically wondered which parts of this process would be synchronous and which parts would be asynchronous 
uh, specifically um, for yeah. the group exams, yeah, for the group right? assessment, yeah. Yeah. Mm. For the group assessment, yes. Uh, well, normally we for the online group assessments, it's completely synchronous. Right. So I must honestly tell you that I never thought about defining it into asynchronous as synchronous, but it's a really good idea because then you take then you limit the time of the synchronous uh, evaluation and you already get some idea like the questions and answers uh, well thinking out loud but the questions and answers moment for within synchronous uh, team exams could be taken out and just sent out to them and then of course the synchronous part uh, is reduced and you already get a feel of who will be the strong or the stronger one or the less yep. stronger one so that, that's Okay, I think that, that makes a, a lot of sense. A very uh, to finish on a very practical uh, question from Natalie Ross that uh, the poor thing asked twice in the in the chat, and I didn't get round to asking you earlier on the proctoring hall you showed at the very beginning on, on one of your first uh, slides. Can you can you tell us where that is, please, or which one it is? The yes, yes, the proctoring room. Uh, ah, the, right wait, let me just to be sure that I have the. Uh, the Almost there. Ah, ah, one back maybe. Ah, wait. Yes, yes, I think it's that one. Is on it the this right. one? This one is actually from reconnect from a Barco system. So Barco systems is the are the ones who are making these huge IMAX and 4D cinema screens. <laughs> but now they have uh, developed an online lecturing hall and i tested it myself this is to me this is the closest you can get to a classical lecture hall as possible because you have a whiteboard so you see this man here um, but he has behind him he has a whiteboard he can use polls he can use uh, he can even use the learning analytics coming back from the system and transform them into uh, a graph so you can see who is talking more than someone else and so make complete learning analytics uh, from that from the logs as well so personally i really i was really i'm still enthusiastic about it and i know that in um, the i it's in barcelona they have one in a business school which is called ISE, I think, and they are they build it together with Barco. So this system, they they provided the academic and the lecturing feedback, and then Barco went back to the design and everything. And so you can ask them to uh, visit one of their. They have these rooms, which is a completely virtual one, and then they have hybrid rooms. So you have students physically present and then those uh, things those screens that you see in the back are on the wall of the classroom and that's for the ones uh, the students at a distance so but i don't have any benefit sure. from telling uh telling this just okay, to be sure very much indeed, but indeed because i like i'll let I you scream down to the end whether you can leave your final your side. It's been a wonderful presentation. We're very grateful for your, your presence here today. Uh, thank you very much. And we're also grateful for everyone who's thank you for inviting more than welcome. Me. And also the people who've uh, attended. We have um, our next um, Eating Together in yes. Time of Crisis webinar coming up next Monday at uh, um, 5 p.m. Central European Standard Time. And our Eden conference, which is now fully online. Please connect to our website, um, edenonline.org to find the information for that. Thank you very much to everybody and keep safe. Bye. Yeah, thank you. Bye. Thank Bye. you for being here. Bye.